Van avond. Thanks very much. Um, and again, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I pay no mind to this. It's a, I'd love to say it's an old injury, but it's not. Um, as uh, Steve said, my name's John McCourt. I'm a, a dairy man. And dairy's a strange place because what we call the place will tell you who we are. I call it dairy. It means I'm Catholic. I'm nationalist. I'm Republican. Uh, I'm Republican in in the Irish context means something completely different than Republican in the American context. Uh, and I live on the west bank of the River Foyd, which divides the city that I live in. If I called the place I live in Londonderry, it would mean I was Protestant, Unionist, Loyalist, and in all probability, with the exceptions of a very, very small community that lives behind an enclosed fence on the west bank of the river, I would probably I would live on the east bank of the river. Um, 
and that's the division that that happened that has happened as a result of the la of the recent phase of a very very long conflict. Um, I do have a bit of a note here that I was going to f that I'm going to use, and I might if I can get it up, I'll use it. But if it doesn't, yeah, it's okay. So my intention is not to spend to bore you all with 800 years of Irish history. Um, the discussion will focus on the conflict from the late 1960s to the end of the 1990s. From the Republican nationalist perspective, there are two linked causes for the conflict in Ireland. One is the British presence, and the other was the division of Ireland into a 26-county uh, free state and a northern six-county statelet. The establishment of the state came about ultimately as a result of a protracted campaign over many generations against the British. The campaign was a, uh, oh yeah, see this is the thing about using notes. <laughs> so it is, um, and the, it, yeah, 800 years of conflict ended up in the English deciding um, that they had to sit down and talk with the Irish. And the, the conclusion of that was partition of Ireland. 26 counties became the Free State, now known as the Irish Republic. The six counties in the north remained British. To divide Ireland the way they divided, they, they did divide it, was part of the problem. Ireland has had traditionally four provinces. The province of Ulster had nine counties. To divide the island of Ireland along a county basis would have left the nine counties of Ulster in the north and under British control. The Unionists realised that if the nine counties of Ireland became Northern Ireland, they would not have a sustainable Protestant majority in the north. So they cut off three counties. There are now six counties in Northern Ireland. And in 1922, it was foreseen that there would be a one-third Protestant sustainable majority in the north. That's where the problem came from. If with the establishment of the state, the uh, legislation had been put in place for a society, to create a society of equals in the North, we would not have had the problem that we eventually had. But with the dominance of, uh, of, of unionism, and particularly unionism in three phases, unionism from the ascendancy, the ruling class, the middle class unionist and the working class unionist, more commonly in Northern Ireland now called the loyalist. And against that, uh, you know, those three sort of class or three, three different structures of unionism um, were overseeing what was eventually become a Catholic underclass. Um, legislation in place included discrimination. It uh, prevented the Catholic minority from getting anywhere up the political ladder. Uh, the 1947 Education Act became the one opportunity for, for, for people from the Catholic community to see any way at all out of the position that they were in. Um, and benefiting from the 1947 Education Act were people whose names you will know, people like John Hume, Seamus Heaney. They were all beneficiaries of the, of, the, of the Education Act that allowed Catholics into second and third level education. Um, I want to jump forward to the situation. I'm not going to talk about the whole of the conflict in the north of Ireland. I'm from Derry. I'm a Derry man. This is what I know. But this, as I'm talking about it, it's a reflection of what was happening around the rest of the north of Ireland. The city of Derry has almost always had, from partition, a 70% Catholic majority. The city of Derry had an elected corporation. And between 1922 and the establishment of the state of Northern Ireland and the collapse of local government in 1972, the Catholic majority in the city of Derry never had a majority on the city council. That was arranged through a system um, first thought of, developed and implemented in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts by Governor Eldridge Gerry. The system that became known as gerrymandering, political gerrymandering, where the electoral boundaries were switched, were moved, so that a sustainable, uh, uh, that a, a forecastable vote um, was going to be in place. And the city council was made up of 12 representatives. Eight of them were unionists and four of them were nationalists in a city that had a 70% Catholic majority and that was for 50 years. Among the other issues that corporations deal with or city councils deal with, the same as yourselves, they clean the streets, they bury the dead, 
They cut the hedges, all of that stuff. But alongside that, the corporations or local councils were given the authority over the building of public housing. And the rules were set out at the very start. You could only vote in a council election if you were a householder. So how do you stop the majority in the city becoming a majority on the council? You don't let them vote. And you don't let them vote because you don't build them houses. And if you had no house, you had no vote. I was uh, in a, an engineering class in 1960, 1968. Started in September 1968. And uh, for the first time in my life, I sat in a class with real live Protestants. <laughs> and they weren't trying to eat me or they weren't trying to turn me into being a Protestant or any of that. You know, they're actually quite nice guys. And uh, that's as a result of our segregated system of education. You may find it hard to believe that in the north of Ireland, we right now spend over £200 million pounds a year funding six separate systems of education. We have the uh, state and schools. In the north of Ireland, they call them Protestant schools. They're not actually Protestant schools. Um, quite a few Catholics go to them. The states, state schools, we have the Catholic maintained sector, which the Catholic Church are responsible for the, uh, for the, for, for the education program. We have uh, the integrated sector, which fortunately is a growing sector. I think something like 28% of the kids in the education system in the North now uh, go, to, uh, go to integrated schools, uh, and that's growing. We have education through the medium of Irish, which means that children who at three or four years of age go into a school, and from they go in the door until they come out, they speak nothing but Irish. Um, and as well as that, we have well, there's a small um, independent sector as well. And as well as that, we have children with special needs. Strangely enough, 1947 Education Act made special provision for children with special needs. Only the kids with special needs, by legislation, were educated together. Protestant and Catholic school children were educated in the same schools because they had special needs. What was so special? Why could that model not have been taken out? and to the rest of society. It would have saved us a lot of problems. As I said, 17 years of age, I met my first real-life Protestant. And uh, I mean, considering the fact that my father uh, was born Presbyterian and, and converted to Catholicism before he married my mother. So my father, living, my father at home wasn't a Protestant to all intents and purposes. And, uh, the, uh, and somebody came into the college, into the uh, students' common room, and put a notice on the board at the end of September, and it said uh, a civil rights march will be held in Derry on the 5th of October 1968. I'm looking at it going civil rights. You know, that's Martin Luther King territory. That's Alabama and Mississippi. That's black people in America. It's nothing to do with us, you know. But I had a conversation with the guy, and he starts talking about jobs and houses and votes. And I'm, uh, you know, here I am in a college and engineering course that I really didn't have to make a big effort to get into. Um, I actually had a placement set for myself two years down the line, so I didn't have to worry about a job. They were marching about houses. I was living in a three-bedroom house. I had an inside toilet. Uh, and they were talking about votes. I was 17 years of age. You couldn't vote in the north of Ireland until you were 21. So votes and jobs and houses, this had nothing to do with me. And many times over the last... Uh, over the last 45 years, I wished I'd just kept that thought in my head and went about my business. <laughs> but I went off to see this march, and on the way to the march, I met this young Protestant friend of mine. And we stood at the end of the bridge on the, on the west side of the river, talking for a while. And we'd arranged that we were going to go across the river to see this march. And I turned to him and said, it looks like they're ready to start. Come on, we'll go over. And he said, no, sure, I'll see you later. And I walked off, and I didn't see him again for 35 years after that day. And uh, next thing I heard was the roaring and shouting, and I thought this must be a really big march. It wasn't really. There were only 400 people on the march. And the roaring and shouting came from the fact that the police had turned water cannon on and were now starting to beat into um, the demonstrators who were there marching for jobs and votes and houses and equality. And among the people who were marching were what we would have considered to have been the pillars of Catholic society, lecturers in the college, you know, um, some of the businessmen, um, guy who was a 
very well up in the trade union movement, which I thought was a strange one for a, a Catholic, you know, to have a leadership position in the trade union movement. And, uh, and of course, among them were, there were what were described as the few left-wing radicals. It took me a couple of years figuring out what a left-wing radical was. But uh, the march was beaten across the bridge by the police, and by the time we got to the far side of the, of the bridge and down into the city, less than 200 people, half of the people that started off on the march, were now there. And the rally started, and they start talking about jobs and votes and houses, and I'm getting bored. Then somebody started to explain to me the link between housing, votes, and the power of the local corporation. In a city, as I said, with a 70% Catholic majority, they decided, the corporation decided, that they weren't going to build houses for Catholics because that could shift the balance of power. And the reason why my everything changed for me that day was as this guy was talking, I realized something different. I had spent 10 years in a boy's home in Derry because my mother couldn't get a house in the city where she was born, in the city that she left school when she was 14 years of age and went to work in the shirt factory, in the city that she married uh, a man who was in the Royal Air Force, who had been shot down over the North Atlantic, who survived, was rescued, taken to Reykjavik in Iceland and after the war repatriated, and eventually the victim of, a, of an accident um, that landed him in hospital. And as a result of that, they went to tell my mother what happened to him. And my mother was pregnant with my younger sister. My mother went into labor. And temporarily, somebody made a decision that we would go into care. That temporary care lasted for 10 years. Um, at this point, quite a few people will be aware of the ongoing um, investigations into historical institutional abuse in the north of Ireland. Uh, it was one of the issues that I raised and one of the issues that I fought with others. Um, to, to, you know, to have investigated uh, at this point. You may be aware, certainly could look up the uh, Ryan report from the 26 counties, which outlines um, decades of abuse of young people at the hands of those that ran uh, church-run institutions in the South. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that, but you know, that I'd spent 10 years in a boy's home because my mother couldn't get a house in Derry. And that put me out on the street, marching, sitting on the road, singing songs, carrying banners, and um, protesting, you know. And, and in the middle of some of these protests, we'd sit down on the road and every, you know, and of course the leadership of the civil rights movement would talk about nonviolence. And uh, yeah, that's great. Um, until somebody decides they're going to beat you over the head. And then they start quoting now uh, that, you know, civil rights leaders start talking about Martin Luther King and, uh, and nonviolence and Mahatma Gandhi and nonviolence. And every now and then they talk about Jesus and turn the other cheek. 17 years of age, I'm sitting on the road and a policeman's just hit me over the head with a bat. He's going to turn the other cheek and when I finish turning that, there's nothing left to turn. You make a decision to lie down or stand up. And my decision was to stand up. And between October 1969 and January of 1969, there were ongoing battles with the police every time there was a protest. That first protest had 400 people on it. Two weeks later, there was a protest with 50,000 people in Derry on the bridge protesting against the abuse by the state and the police of the civil rights marchers two weeks earlier. But this conflict was now rolling down the hill. And uh, August or January 1969, it got so bad that we decided that we would close off the area of the city of Derry that we lived in ripped up the curb stones, the flag stones, and uh, everything else we could get, and blocked off an area that was half a mile deep and over a quarter of a mile wide. And the area got the name Free Derry from the slogan that was painted on the wall as a message to the police that when they came back in through those barricades, they were now no longer in the state of Northern Ireland. The message on the wall said, you are now entering Free Derry. And the barricades went up, and between... January of 1969 and uh, July of 1972, those barricades were maintained. When the British government decided that they wanted to claim back their territory, they mobilized 22,000 soldiers to take it back, twice the force that the American army used to take Fallujah in the first Iraq war. January 1972 would probably be one of the most uh, memorable days for people in Derry. On the 9th of August 1971, the government 
um, decided that the situation got so far out of control, out of control, they introduced internment. Anybody that was suspected of posing a threat to the security of the state could be held for as long as that threat existed. There was no trial. There was no lawyers involved. On the word of a senior police officer, um, an internment order was signed, and you were held until the threat was not considered to be there anymore. And the civil rights association started protesting against internment. Instead of holding small protests right around the north, they decided they'd hold one big protest in Derry on the 30th of January 1972. 20,000 people took part in that demonstration. It was to go to the Guildhall, which was where the first civil rights demonstration ended up. The army and the police decided it wasn't going to get there. And uh, they blocked off the road. And the Civil Rights Association didn't want to get into a fight with the army. So they sent marshals down to stop young people getting down as far as the soldiers. And uh, the march came down. It was directed into the bog side. But you know, 19 years of age, it's going to be a lot more fun throwing rocks at the army than it is going listening to people um, and speeches, which hadn't changed anything. The army pulled back their barriers at three minutes past four on the 30th of January 1972. They came into the bog side. They left the bog side at 21 minutes past four. And in those 18 minutes, they shot 28 people and completely transformed the character of the conflict in the North. By the end of 1971, most of the original demands of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Movement had already been met. The right to vote was given to anybody that was over 21. There was no property entitlement. The, uh, Power of local corporations to build houses had been taken away and given to an independent authority. That independent authority would now build houses on the basis of need rather than on the basis of political expediency. The uh, police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, had been disarmed. The 100% Unionist Special um, Reserve Police Force, the B Specials, had been disbanded. Everything was in place for us to get round the table or for politicians or leadership to get around the table and start talking about creating a new future. And 18 minutes on the 30th of January 1971 brought their war to us. And the IRA, at that point, an organization that had been reformed from 1969, um, decided that they brought their war to us. It was now time to take the war to them. Between 1972 and 1976, a third of the commercial properties inside the city of Derry were blown apart by the IRA. Most of those businesses would be known by members of the Protestant or Unionist community. And there's an interesting sort of demographic that happens in a situation like this, and I've seen it through some of the other work that I've done more recently, is when the business community start getting insecure and start moving, other people start getting shaky. And when the business was blown up, it might have been a family business, maybe a grandfather, a son, and a granddaughter working, selling watches or tea towels or cups or whatever it was they were selling. When that business was blown up, they now had no income. They had to make a decision whether they were going to stay, rebuild, run the risk of it happening again, or move out. And they moved out. They moved to the other side of the river. They moved further up the country. And when the business community started moving, the white-collar worker decided that if they're going, we're going. Then the blue-collar worker decided that if the Protestant Unionist blue-collar worker on the west bank of the city decided that they're going, we're going. And then what I described of the people with no collars, the working class Protestant living in an area alongside his Catholic neighbours, makes the decision that he doesn't want to be there either. The equivalent of white flight. Nobody wanted to be the last Protestant in a totally Catholic west bank. Between 1969 and 1976, over 20,000 members of the Protestant community moved from the west bank of the river to the other side of the river. And we now have a population of 97.3% um, Catholic majority on the west bank of the, of the river Foyle in the city of Derry. And a very small Protestant enclave that's closed in by a 25 foot high brick wall with a fence over the top of it. Um, and that's what there is, less than 400 people living in that one small area. Um, the conflict went on between, again, between 1970, yeah, I suppose between 1969 
and the first death in Derry, which was a member of the Protestant community who came out onto the street after being told that his son was being beaten up. And uh, he ended up being beaten up and dying. Um, right through from then to 2007. Um, Catholics, Protestants, um, soldiers, policemen, even a young Indian man whose family had followed a British Army regiment through the time of the Raj in India, arrived back in Derry with the regiment, bringing newspapers and cigarettes to soldiers on their base, ended up dying in the middle of this conflict. Over 400 people died in Derry. Over 3,500 people died in the north of Ireland between 1969 and the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And, and where did it change? By uh, 1975, I got sick. I ended up getting a real bad lung infection. I ended up in hospital in Galway, which is 170 miles down the road from Derry. And when I felt strong enough, I decided I was coming back. I wanted to get stuck in again. But it took me a week getting from Derry to Galway, or from Galway to Derry. And every night I sat and I talked to people. And the more I talked to people, the more I was convinced that even though the armed conflict would continue, there had to be another way. And by the time I got back to Derry, I met with a few old friends, including a guy who'd been interned in August 1971. And we stood and we talked about looking for this other way. And the war went on. But by 1974, I think, the year that we had determined would be the year of victory. I think the situation had got so far beyond um, pulling it back that uh, it looked like there wasn't going to be an end. Bloody Sunday certainly unleashed the IRA. It unleashed the IRA not just throughout the north of Ireland but on England and on European army bases as well. As that happened, um, the government responded. More soldiers, more guns, more deaths. And one of the other things that came out of that in 1970, July 1972, the IRA planted a series of bombs in Belfast in a day that became known as Bloody Friday. And over a period of 20, I think 25 minutes, those car bombs exploded, some of them so close together that people were running from the site of one bomb right on to the site of the next. Over 150 people were horribly mutilated. And for the first time in our lives, we actually saw on television at tea time the results of a bomb explosion where you saw the bits and pieces of what would be described as human detritus, thrown onto stretchers or carried onto stretchers or wrapped up in blankets, and suddenly this was what war was about. Um, but there were discussions in 1974. The uh, British government had brought the leadership of the IRA to London to talk about a way out. Um, and those sort of discussions seemed to get somewhere with a bit of a ceasefire, but then something else would happen. And almost like Bloody Sunday, just when you're on the verge of hoping that you could conclude this, um, as I say, the Brits go, the army, the British go and put their foot in it again, and it all goes wrong. And it was right through until 1994, with the assistance of certainly um, senior members of the American government, um, people from South Africa, uh, people who were involved in the United Nations, some of the Norwegians, um, an international sort of delegations of different um, sort of levels were involved in discussions that would eventually lead to the IRA ceasefire in August uh, 1994. And uh, I actually believe that ceasefire didn't necessarily come from all of those discussions. It came from the fact that both the British and the Irish realized that this war was intractable, that nobody was going to win and nobody was prepared to lose. And uh, as the discussions went on in the city of Derry in the late, or, yeah, the late 1980s, we had already decided that we could make change on the ground that would significantly contribute to creating a lasting peace. And it meant going and talking with those that we had formerly described as our enemies go and meet in the community that had been taken to the other side, that had gone to the other side of the river, engaging with them, engaging with their political leadership, engaging with loyalism at a community and working class level, and uh, not posing any threat to them, 
eventually as a result of that, we were able to reconnect people in the city of Derry that hadn't seen each other, hadn't been with each other, hadn't met each other in almost 20 years. And as a result of that, the conversation started. Eventually, lo you know, loyalists in, in working class loyalist areas get curious about what a former member of the IRA is doing coming in and out of here. You know, other people get curious about why, why all of this work's happening. This was about building trust across communities. And eventually got uh, an agreement. Uh, there was an agreement in Derry between the IRA and loyalism of uh, an informal agreement of a no first strike policy. In other words, if you didn't shoot any of ours, we'll not shoot any of yours. And built on that sort of relationship, you started seeing things change. Communities were being more trusting. And within communities, people were actually starting to see hope. And what we did at that point as an organization, I was a member at that point of the Peace and Reconciliation Group in Derry, we decided that now that we had com communities actually trusting us, that we had a, a, a sort of a relationship with the armed protagonists of the conflict in Derry, in other words, Republicans and loyalists, that that wouldn't be sufficient to stop the violence on the streets. And we made the bold move to go and almost kick down the army's door, which is a bit strange after them coming, kicking down mines for quite a few years. And eventually sat down with the senior <coughs> army officer in Derry and uh, said to him, you know, there's a way we can find, if we, if we work at it, that we can change this. And that started a process of de-escalation. This wasn't about stopping a war. This is about creating the conditions on the ground where war would not be the first necessary, the first and only option. So de-escalation eventually after discussion and seeing the numbers of soldiers move from, I suppose, daily 500 soldiers on the street down to a point where you had 50 soldiers on the street in the whole city responding rather than, rather than being out there first to situations as they would arise and led to a situation of disengagement. As this was all going on, the uh, political wing of the Republican movement, Sinn Féin, decided that they would canvass all of their people to find out what direction they should take. They actually held a public forum around the whole island of Ireland and invited people from right across the community to come in and tell them what, where they wanted it to go. And the report from that was published. And uh, eventually what we have is a, a situation of, as I said, disengagement leading to the eventual demilitarization of the conflict in Derry. A year and a half before the uh, IRA declared a ceasefire. We're talking about soldiers no longer wearing tan hats, no longer riding around in, in six-wheeled, heavy, armoured vehicles. We're now riding around in light-skinned um, Land Rovers, um, patrols that used to have double the armour that any normal soldier would ever want to carry. We're now out there wearing soft berries and, uh, and rifles or riot guns. And... Uh, Eventually, you know, I, I mean, what we had was a situation that proved that it was possible through negotiation um, with all of the parties involved and without anybody actually appearing to sell out. See, I have this idea that buying in to change isn't about selling out. It's about finding a new way. And uh, eventually the IRA declared its ceasefire, followed very shortly by the loyalists uh, declaring their ceasefire. And... Uh, by 2007, um, the army had gone. And I remember that first day that the soldiers arrived in Derry. It was the uh, 14th of August, 1969. Big green truck pulled up on the edge of the bog site. And uh, at that point, we had beaten the police out of the bog site. They had nowhere to go. The army arrived. And I remember that young soldier jumping off the truck and not realizing back then that he would be the first of half a million sets of soldiers' feet that would tramp around the north of Ireland for the next 38 years in the longest ever British military operation. And he didn't know, and we didn't know, that by the time the last soldier would leave, it would cost us over 3,500 lives. Um, we have big legacy issues. Tens of thousands of people have been injured physically through the conflict. Um, we've probably had something like 40,000 people who spent time in prison as a result of their involvement in the conflict. We have still a mistrust of communities 
of the other community and of where this process is going. The euphoria that surrounded the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 dissipated, I think, because of the lack of engagement of those who were apparently running and funding the peace process with the communities on the ground that were supposed to be the beneficiaries of the peace process. Um, but the assemblies there, it's not working in as well as it used to work, but it's still there. As far as I'm concerned, it's, it, it still functions. Um, people are in a better place than they were. Um, the walls of Derry, which significantly for the Protestant population meant so much over the years, over the generations, were always seen by the Catholic community at one point as having been a noose around their neck. And a few years back, um, as after the, the, the work of instilling or trickling down the impact of the peace process to the city, um, a guy called Paddy Doherty was the leader of the uh, Bogside, res or the Bogside Community Defence Association, which was the nationalist, nationalist organisation that put the barricades around the Bogside. He described that when he talked about the, about the walls of Derry, he said once they were a noose and now they're a necklace. Anybody that's been to Northern Ireland, anybody that's been to Derry, and anybody certainly that was in Derry last year would understand the significance of that statement. The walls of Derry were seen by the Catholic community, the majority in the city, as not being theirs. They were a noose around their neck. They were a legacy of plantation. And now to be actually turned around and use those as a civic asset to bring people to the city. Now that's where we're at with it. Not everybody agreed with the, uh, with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, there were people within the Republican movement who saw it as a sellout. Uh, but the first couple of years, we didn't have an awful lot of reaction against it. But as the dream was not being fulfilled in the time that people felt they should have been seeing benefit from the process, it actually opened the door for what are classed as dissident Republican organizations, small armed groups that feel they have the right to take up the mantle of the Republican movement, of the armed Republican movement, and uh, take us back into an armed conflict. Um, fortunately, I believe that we're, at, we're way beyond the fulcrum point in the conflict in the North. There's so much weighing on the possibility of us moving forward that the impact of those small dissident armed groups um, won't be enough to destabilize this process to anywhere near the level that it had previously been. But they still pose a threat. And I think uh, the next move is actually engaging with them. And that's the difficulty I know for governments. I know it's a difficulty for unionism. It's a difficulty at, at some level for republicanism too, to have to engage again with those that were their former enemy. But uh, over the years, the one thing I have learned is that the force of argument is greater than the argument of force. And that's what our politics now are about. I think there might be a couple of questions, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the Good Friday Agreement enshrined within it the principle of, uh, you know, that, that the unionist, well, this, this, when the state of, of Northern Ireland was established, we're talking about a, a two-thirds unionist majority. That now is, is almost level. We're talking about 49, 51, we might even at this point be talking about 50, 50, you know, but, but without the unionist population in the North deciding that they want to be part of the Republic, that can't happen. It's in the agreement. Um, I think they're the, you know, the, I mean the working out of the politic of that's going to be difficult and I, I think we may talk about a generation where people are actually bedding in on this peace process. That If we can establish a situation in the North where there is equality, where there is trust, where the law is equally applied to everyone, 
um, where it becomes a place to be either Catholic or Protestant doesn't leave you um, disenfranchised or disadvantaged. If we can create that situation in the North over the next generation, then I think we could be in a place where it would be possible for unionism to see the advantage of an all-Ireland state rather than as a partition state. Um, I've always said that, you know, that it's better to be 20% uh, of something than 50% of nothing. The problem is that the minute the economy, which is one of the reasons that's always thrown back at nationalists, the economy in the Republic of Ireland is not strong. And, you know, people would always think about, is it going to advantage me? No, right now it's not. And one of the things is that, we're, again, we're going to have to have, I think the phrase that we used for it was a, was a, a, a sunset clause built into the signing off of any agreement, any future agreement, that it will take 10, 15, 20 years of support, of financial support, um, to enable that to happen. Um, but, again, you know, I mean, it, happens, it, will ha it can only happen with the agreement of all of the people. <laughs> that was a very, very interesting week. A very, very interesting week. You know, we saw the Scottish flag fly over um, the wall that says you are now entering Free Dairy. I thought that was real strange, you know, because the Scottish flag is normally associated with the Protestant community. It flies in the fountain and it flies on the Shankill Road. It doesn't normally fly in the bog side. So I think part of, uh, you know, it might actually be the, the reworking of the old idiom that, you know, that, that, uh, that England threats Ireland's opportunity, and maybe people were seeing that, you know, if they lose Scotland, they might be prepared to lose us as well. But I know, yeah, we, I mean, within unionism, there was great fear that that would happen. And in fact, the vote was not that, it wasn't that far apart when you think of what they were forecasting it would be, you know? So, f I mean, uh, uh, another, another referendum in 10 years, um, and a tandem refer referendum in the North uh, might actually make this work. You know, it'll be interesting because I remember uh, I was involved in a course from uh, just trying to think uh, from somewhere in the States a few years back, and it was actually entitled The Disunited Kingdom rather than The United Kingdom. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that works out. Yeah? I spent the last two summers in Ashby sitting on trees in Belfast. And so I've witnessed the July 12th protests and marches and the Warren Porter and all that. Do you think that would ever lead to another violent uh, action like Floyd or something? Um, I would like to think that there were enough lessons learned at this time that we would never have the repeat of a bloody Sunday. Firstly, we haven't got the massive British presence on the ground that we did have back then. Um, the, you know, the political will, I think, um, to engage the army back in the conflict in the north is something I can't see the British government saying it's standing over. Um, I know it's certainly not what the people in the north of Ireland want. Um, and interesting that you mentioned marches because, uh, I mean, the city that I'm from, the city of Derry, 1996, we had a a riot in the city as a result of what happened in, uh, in, in Drum Cree up in County Armagh, where the demographic shift of a population from what once was a Protestant area, um, the Protestant families had all gone. We're now talking about one road, uh, the Gervahi Road, which now had a Catholic housing estate on it. And the Orange Order insisted that this was their traditional route to return on their march. And it didn't matter that it now was a Catholic area. So the, the dispute started, the road got blocked, and a riot broke out in Derry as a result of the Orange Order actually getting marching down that road. Six and a half million pounds damage were caused in that weekend. And the following week, um, I and members of the Peace and Reconciliation Group arranged a meeting with the Apprentice Boys of Derry. We also arranged a meeting with the newly formed Bogside Residents Group that were supporting the right of the Catholic community in uh, the Gervahi Road to protest against the march that had taken place and uh, got the Apprentice Boys and the um, Bogside Residence Group into a room that started a series of dialogue that over a period of five years led from 500 soldiers and 500 policemen being on duty for the Apprentice Boys march in Derry. Ten years later, um, four policemen standing in the, in the diamond wearing high visibility vests and directing traffic as 25,000 members of the Apprentice Boys came to celebrate uh, the relief of Derry in, uh, in, in the city. 
So again, you know, I mean, I think Derry does lead the way. That's the problem in Belfast. The loyalist community aren't prepared to talk, um, sit at the same table with the nationalist community. The Orange Order, for many years, decided that they wouldn't sit at the table with any representatives of the nationalist community that were denying their traditional right to walk down a road. So, you know, I mean, the, uh, the issue of, of marches tied in with the issue of flags, which again you would be familiar with from last year, um, are legacy issues that have to be dealt with and hopefully dealt with through negotiation the same way as we've managed to do it in Derry and um, to make it happen. You know, it's ridiculous that the whole of Belfast should come to a standstill over 200 yards of road. But that's the reality and, you know, and that's how far people certainly from the loyalist community feel that they have been pushed, that everything else that, that they had stood for had been taken away from them and all they're left with is their march. And if they haven't got that, they have nothing. And I'd like to think, and, you know, and, and you know, my view is that within loyalist working class communities, there is a will to see a way through this. The thing is that the leadership of the organizations that would be responsible for making that happen aren't prepared to take the cue from the working class communities that they would say they represent. John, you made a point yesterday when you spoke to the honor students that a lot of Americans believe that this is actually a battle, has been a battle over theology or the differences between Roman Catholicism and versions of Protestantism. Can you briefly explain why that's really not what it's about? Well, I mean, that's a 400-year-old argument, you know. <laughs> right. Um, you, know, the, uh, the, you know, the planter community and all of the history that that brings with it. And my, my own view is that, for me, certainly, my involvement, firstly, with the civil rights movement, and secondly, with, uh, with, with the IRA, was never a sector, never seen it as involvement in a sectarian campaign. Now, that's my view. But if I was a Protestant living in a Protestant working class area where um, my neighbors, my family, were uh, being killed by the IRA because they were part time members of the army, part time members of the police force because they were bringing bread into an army base. They were seen as upholding the British presence in Ireland. If I was a Protestant in a Protestant community, my Protestant neighbors are getting killed for those reasons. I'm not going to see them as being killed um, for upholding the British presence in Ireland. I'm going to see them as being killed because they were Protestants. But for me, this has never been a conflict about religion. This has been a class conflict. And I think maybe our difficulty was that prior to the first march, uh, in October 1968, if the Civil Rights Association had engaged at a deeper level, particularly with the trade union movement, which was very strong in Northern Ireland at that point, the possibility was that we could have had working class Protestants realize that their condition, the condition they were living in, was equally as bad as the condition that the Catholic community on the other side of the road were living in that the housing conditions of working class families were just as bad, just as decrepit, <coughs> you know, that, the, that the, the power of their vote was as useless as the power of the Catholic vote, that the only time they saw their politicians was the week before an election. And in fact, there are stories that before elections, you know, politicians, knowing that their name was on the ballot paper, would go off on holiday, coming back knowing that they would be elected, because who else was a a member of the Protestant unionist community going to vote for it except for a unionist. So I think unionism, p political unionism, got itself established, and I think the difficulty was that we weren't able to engage with the Protestant working class enough at a level that would have made the difference to get them on board, challenging the government on, on behalf of all of the working class um, for change. Because housing conditions, as I said, in the bog side, which are, and then the Fountain Estate, that small Protestant estate, were equally as bad. You know, it's ridiculous that in the, t by the tail end, by the, well, by the middle of the 1960s, we still had people in Northern Ireland affected and dying from what were described as third world diseases. The biggest killer in Northern Ireland in the early, early 1960s and late 50s was tuberculosis. Second biggest infliction was polio. Another one that you found was rickets, a vitamin deficiency. You know, this is what was destroying people's lives. And all of this stuff could have been dealt with, as I said, if Protestant and Catholic had united and, and taken it to government. You know, and yeah, we, we could have saved three and a half thousand lives. But then if the state, with its formation in 1922, 
had decided to treat all of its citizens equally, we might never have got to the point where we had an armed conflict. Could you all exercise moderator the privilege and ask a question? Yeah. Um, based on your experiences, is there, are there any lessons that uh, you think could be offered to other regions like the Middle East uh, about ways of, of reducing the amount of violent uh, clashes there? Well, I think, I mean, over the, over certainly since, since the <coughs> mid 1990s, there have been discussions between members of the Republican movement and, uh, and Palestinians. Um, there had certainly been discussions in, about the transition of South Africa. Um, there, you know, uh, there are, I mean, I think there are examples. Whether there are political examples, I'm not sure. But for me, this whole process, and people talk about a peace process, for me, it's actually quite simple. It's a community development process. That's what this is. You know, for me, it was about enhancing the lives of community, letting them see their own potential. And I actually remember back at the start, in the, uh, yeah, it would have been early 1980s. So what have I, I met with a, a Catholic priest who was putting together what he called a house of prayer and reconciliation. I actually met him with a, a former internee who had been tortured by the security forces when he was interned. And uh, we went and we talked with this priest and uh, he had this wee meeting. I decided he would have a reading from the Bible. And it's strange, because I don't do Bibles and quotes and stuff like that. And uh, Father Neil Carlin actually started, uh, he started this wee piece by saying, reading from the Bible. And he said, and they asked of him, what is the greatest of the commandments? And he, uh, Jesus, replied, to love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. See, the first part of that's all theology second part of it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The impossibility of loving your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And I'm not talking about vanity. I'm not talking about getting up and looking in the mirror. I'd have to do a lot of work and saying, I'm very gorgeous, you know. <laughs> I'm talking about that thing about finding in yourself self-worth, value. <coughs> what makes you what you are? Finding your roots, finding your strength in culture and history and all of that. And from that position of understanding that you're a full person, being able to reach out to somebody else. And that's the example, I think, that you bring everywhere else. And it's something I do talk about. I mean, and, uh, it's the 8th of November. I'm going to do a piece of work uh, with a group of people I've worked with for about seven years, an organization called Transition International. And uh, their involvement in work is in demobilization, disarmament, and the reintegration of ex-combatants. And I'll be working with people from Sierra Leone, Liberia, Angola, Rwanda, Burundi, the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, like Afghanistan. In fact, everywhere there's been a war in the last 20 years, we'll have people come to, you know, it's just so that we can share experience that will enable people to start seeing things a different way. There isn't a book, there isn't a manual on this. And anybody that knows me knows I don't do John Paul Lederach. And I can't see much sense in standing in the middle of the road between two communities that are about to blow each other apart and saying, hold on a second, can we see what Lederach has to say about this? It's not going to stop it, you know. That's how you get killed. Um, so a lot of it's going to be experiential learning that's carried over to other places. And yes, there are examples. And it does work, you know, and I've seen places where it's worked and people have come back and told us that they've tried some of the particularly communi community development processes that we've used as peacemaking tools in the North of Ireland, in other parts of the world, and they've seen it work. So I don't think we bring political answers, but certainly I think that thing about humanizing a conflict, and maybe one of the issues that we have the greater difficulty with is seeing people in a position of transformation. <coughs> actually daring to look behind the mask. You know, I wanted to be an engineer. I didn't want to be standing on the street fighting. The situation and my decision to, to get involved in it was what changed that. I could have decided not to do it. I could have decided to go home and pull the curtains. Guess what? In Derry, going home and pulling the curtains might not have kept you safe. I know there are a lot of areas in Belfast where it doesn't keep people safe. Uh, Richard Elgar has a 
Final question. Very quick question. Um, thanks very much for your talk. I went to university in Northern Ireland back in the 80s, so I experienced a bit of the troubles firsthand. Only beaten up once to be in English, but here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question I have, though, is a little different, maybe a little relevant for our audience here. America's been heavily involved in Ireland and Northern Ireland, their politics for many years. We had the peacekeeping, yeah. um, the peace talks with Clinton. Tom Foley was there yeah. as well, Tip O'Neill. And then fast forward to 2001 and uh, the, uh, the, attack of, the attack of 9-11 and the idea that a lot of funding for organizations like the IRA came through organizations like NORA, yeah. which is based in the United States. I'm just wondering if you feel that the role of the U.S. has changed and kind of helped the peace process a bit since that time. Yeah, I, you know, if, I mean, I would say that certainly in the, in the 1990s, I know back as far as 1986, John Hume was putting pressure on the American administration um, to cut the funding from Irish America going to buy guns to kill kids on our streets in Ireland. Um, so, you know, it wasn't something that, that certainly uh, John Hume and the SDLP didn't see. Certainly the Irish government would have seen that as well. Um, but I think the, um, the engagement of the American government at, at the political level in helping, I think, maybe modernize the way of looking at the Irish conflict and transforming a conflict, I think was important. Clint, uh, both Clinton's uh, contributions, certainly, of all of the American presidents, with the exceptions of, you know, I mean, I mean my, my mother, God rest her, was 98 when she died, and t until the day she died, she had this picture on her, on her, on her wall, and it had uh, Our Lady, the Pope, and John F. Kennedy, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we, we've always had this, uh, this thing about the Americans at some point are going to be saints and save us, you know. But, uh, no, I think that that involvement was very important. I think, again, you know, without doubt, 9-11 was a significant impact on forcing the Republican movement away from violence, whether they would be prepared to admit that or not. Because even up until... Well, up until 9-11, you know, I mean, there would have been people in Irish America that still had that vision of black and tans coming and kicking down doors, you know, and people getting murdered in the streets and stuff like that. You know, that that was their reason, their almost, you know, their sort of national guilt that made them contribute to organizations like Noriad. And suddenly that wasn't cool anymore. You know, now we're talking about this is what terrorism is, and there isn't a romantic version of it. And suddenly everything changes. But I think to be able to hold it together through 9-11 to to, for, for the administration to continue, the American administration to continue to support the talks. And considering the fact that two weeks after Bill Clinton had been in my city, the IRA set off a massive car bomb in Canary Wharf in London. You know, but even after that to say, look, no, there has to be a way of pushing this forward, that commitment. And again, you know, commitment has to be something more than words. It has to be more than sitting around the table. It has to be supported. And I think there was tremendous financial support, certainly, in bringing investment um, to, to, to Northern Ireland that helped in some way buy us into peace, buy us into normality. Maybe, you know, we weren't as, uh, we weren't as ethically sound as we should have been. I mean, in the city of Derry, one of the employers that we got was Raytheon. as our peace dividend. Raytheon make the guidance system for crews missing. Yeah, come to Derry, be part of our peace process. Just make weapons to kill people somewhere else. You know, I think, you know, there's something we have to look at there. Raytheon aren't in Derry anymore. As a result of protests and, um, yeah, some direct action, Ray Raytheon decided that maybe Derry wasn't the place they wanted to be. But... Uh, you know, no, I think, w again, without the support of the, of, of the American administration, it would have been difficult to, to get us to the place where we are. And I think uh, the, American Ireland, uh, the, uh, the American Ireland Fund, the contribution certainly of, of, of academia. You know, I, I, was, uh, I just saw last week an event held in Belfast in the new Titanic Quarter, a thousand students, both American and, uh, and students from Northern Ireland, who'd been back and forward on, on uh, British-Irish scholarships from the mid-1970s met up in the Titanic Quarter in Belfast. You know, uh, and that thing again about creating opportunities to get some of our young people out of the place to see something else of the world and start bringing back experience and skills and prospects of employment were all things, you know, we're no longer the insular society that we were. But again, I think, you, you know, without a doubt, the American contribution was, was you know, it, I don't think we would have got to where we were had it not been for their for their interest, and particularly the interest of the 
of the Clinton administration. I'm sorry to say it doesn't seem to have carried on, but I, you know, but, well, not at the same level, but I do realize that there are other press and opportunities around the world that, uh, that the American government are committed to. Thank you very much. Before you, before you file out in an orderly fashion, uh, those students that uh, need to sign in for this event, they're in the hallway in the normal place. Uh, I'd also like to announce that Professor Matt Carroll is going to do a faculty-led trip to Northern Ireland.